Well, hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver. Today, I'm going to take a stab at bringing some integral insight to this Judge Kavanaugh drama that is unfolding here in the United States. And of course, Brett Kavanaugh is President Trump's latest nominee to the US Supreme Court, 54 years old, uh, Yale graduate, conservative judge. And it looked like he would be a pretty good shoe-in until he was accused uh, by a woman of attacking her when they were both teenagers in high school. And he was 17 and she was 15. And on Friday, I'm sure most of you know, was where she and he testified in front of a Senate Judiciary Committee. And um, it was one of the most dramatic days of testimony I've ever seen on Capitol Hill. And and really juicy, you know, for in terms of <clears throat> the cultural currents that it embodies. And you could feel that. You could feel the country rocking back and forth that first day where, you know, she's so sympathetic. And then he comes on and he's sympathetic, too, in his own way. And, um, you know, we ended up with, I think, currently a four or five point plurality of voters feeling that he ought not be on the Supreme Court. Uh, So, you know, what looked like a slam dunk for Republicans is in play, uh, on pause sort of for a minute in terms of making news because we're in the middle of a week of FBI investigations into the allegations that were dramatically called also by Jeff Flake and uh, we all know the story. So anyway, during this pause is a good time to take a breath and, you know, see if there is anything that we can understand using an integral lens, an integral view, and, um, you know, feel our way into a a bigger understanding uh, of of this drama. And so I think the first thing I I would do is just point out that this is a perfect example of the principle that evolution, while beautiful, is not pretty. It's beautiful in its outcomes, but not pretty in its means. And that goes for consciousness evolution as well. And that goes for cultural evolution as well. And that's what we're experiencing here is more this interior, the consciousness and cultural evolution of the society. So what could be beautiful about this? And I think the the best way for me to convey that is through my own personal experience of this as a citizen, as a person, and to note that it has evoked a significant evolutionary move in me. I feel like I can see more now than I could two weeks ago about all kinds of things, and I'll try to explain. So I started out when Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh, a a bit of a ho-hum. He seemed like he was another in the mold of Neil Gorsuch. Uh, I knew the Democrats had to resist and fight in order to, um, you know, appease their base, and that, uh, you know, there was a certain head of steam that even I could generate of revenge about what happened to Obama's last Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland, who was not even given a hearing by the Senate, by the Republican Senate. So, you know, I get that there's a partisan fight, just not the most interesting thing to me. And I also thought it was pretty futile because Trump would just come back with somebody and knowing him, (laughs) he would come back with somebody worse. So, you know, what are we really trying to do here? So anyway, the the vetting started, and uh, I heard rumors, as we all did, that there was this woman who claimed that he attacked her in high school, and that caught my ear, and there was some confusion about that, and uh, would she identify herself, would she come to the hearings and so forth, but then it all came together, and on Friday, there she was, sitting in front of the 
Senate Judiciary Committee, which is half Republicans, half Democrats. And we got to hear uh, from her directly. And, um, and so she de- describes the incident. She's 15 years old. She's at a party. She's going up the stairs into the bathroom. And at the top of the stairs, she's pushed into a bedroom by Brett Kavanaugh and his friend, Mark Judge. Uh, Kavanaugh's on top of her on the bed. They turn up the music. They're laughing. He is feeling her up, trying to get in her clothes. She, she's resisting. She's shouting. He puts her hand, his hand over her mouth. And that's where she said she felt like she might be accident. He might accidentally kill her. And then Mark Judge jumps on the bed a couple of times and knocks him over. She gets away in the confusion and they are uh, uh, rampaging their way down the stairs, pounding the walls and laughing. And on she goes away. And that's that's the incident. And that was a. Uh, you know, a very powerful testimony. And I was reminded, it just, you know, as I was listening to her and, 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 and thinking back of what it was to be a teenager and trying to relate it to my own experience, I, I identified and, 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 and really gained a, a deeper sensitivity to three incidents that happened to me when I was in high school and was bullied and attacked. Uh, Not much, actually, because I was pretty good at deflecting and avoiding. But there were three incidents where I, two of which I was physically attacked. And, um, you know, it's interesting to experience that as an adult 40 years later, because when it happened, and I'm not saying that this is, uh, by the way, you know, equal to what happened to her or anything like just that this is what happened to me and hearing to her, hearing her. That, um, you know, for a lot of my life, certainly while I was a teenager, I actually thought I got away pretty good considering I was a tall, gangly gay kid um, in the Steel Valley. And in the Steel Valley, pretty much all the boys got bullied in one way or the other, and there were fights happening all over the place. I wasn't a fighter. I was terrified of that. Uh, Being attacked was terrifying to me. And I remember, you know, hiding and obsessing about it for a long time during the time. But as a whole, I thought, you know, this is the way the world works. And that's sort of the way it is at a traditional stage of development. This sort of thing happens all the time. You hear these People, uh, there was a, a video online of these women saying, you know, what, what, what's the big deal? Boys feel girls up when they're teenagers. You know, there's that sort of traditional understanding of it. This sort of thing happens. And then I can sort of identify that I moved into an orange or modern um, sensibility where, as I think back on it, I basically forgot about those incidents for 40 years. I they were there. I occasionally maybe would think of them, but I gave them no weight. I gave them no, um, you know, extra power or anything. And then there's a move into green. And and I felt myself move into this as I listened to Christine Blasey Ford's testimony, that there's a new sensitivity and I can actually see more and, and I can uh, trace it back to those incidents that there's, there are qualities, there are, there are vibrations of fear in my emotional body that I have to this day, that I can trace back to that. Now, I'm a little ambivalent Did those incidents cause this, and if they hadn't happened, would I not be a fearful, anxious person, which I am as a whole, as a rule? Um, or um, it was, I just destined for that and anything would do. And I actually more and more feel like it's leans. I think there's both in, in, in involved that I was going to be this and anything would take me there ultimately in some way. But I also feel that these were extreme. And, and, and the, the main thing that I relate to now is that I found, find it to be repulsive and it's, 
just absolutely unacceptable to me that any kid should ever go through that today. So that's a move. And it's not, um, again, just me. They're, I think men and women are reconsidering all kinds of behaviors, especially those of us who have lived long enough and were alive where there was a different time and noticing how that time, how different that time was and how much culture has evolved in a good way. And so that we can have a, a, a sort of a new um, requirements. Uh, and we want a new world for our daughters, for our sons. And that is the emergence of green in the culture. And that is the green we want to keep as we move even into integral consciousness. And, I th you know, the, the, the bottom line is, is it more or less likely now after this last week that 17 year olds are going to do what was done to Christine Fort? And I would say that it's considerably less. And that's a good thing. So that's sort of one practice that I would identify as an integral practice that we can use around juicy situations like this Brett Kavanaugh. It's like, what does it mean to me? How do I feel about that? What does it ring? What rings uh, true or what, how can I empathize with what's going on in this situation? And so there's that. And then another integral practice that we can bring in addition to self-observation is to just increase the number of perspectives that we can take on the situation. And so that brings me to Brett Kavanaugh's experience and my experience of him and what conservatives are saying. Most of us listening to this are liberals. Uh, not all by any means, but uh, for me, just to, to bring it back, uh, the practice for me is to feel in to the conservative reaction and response to this drama. And so, you know, you don't have to go far to find it. I'm sure it's all over the social media and it certainly is um, the uh, view of Fox News, especially if you're on the evening opinion shows or the morning uh, Fox and Friends. And it basically boils down to three things is that sum up their perspective. One is that it's a political hit job by the Democrats. And I would have to agree. You know, this is what we're doing here. This, this, that we're playing politics. The politics happens in Washington, D.C. And yeah, it's more partisan than it was. But, you know, this is the nature of the game. And, you know, from my tribal liberal perspective, I'm thinking the Democrats did a good job. Uh, you know, if you want to define something and time it to detonate at just the right moment to maximize your chances of derailing Brett Kavanaugh, you could hardly do any better than what they did. And the conservatives have a whole story about uh, the, much of which is true, you know, to the degree that I can parse it out about them holding the letter and all of this stuff and that she would fly and then she wouldn't fly and whatever. And that ultimately they're playing the Democrats for 2020. They want to keep an 8-8 court uh, and uh, go for the next two years without any nominee from Donald Trump until they have a chance of getting a new president. And um, wow, that is, I guess, what we need to do as, uh, you know, as, as, as tribal fighters. But uh, it doesn't it, it, it doesn't turn me on. And, you know, I, I do want to notice that the piece of the truth about it was a political hit job and a very successful one uh, managed by the stage managed by the Democrats. Number two in the conservative view, Christine Ford is mistaken. Is that possible? Uh, I personally, and I, I, most people I know were convinced that what she was saying was true that she believed it for sure. But is it possible that she's mistaken? Yes, absolutely. 
And, um, you know, all you have to do is watch Judge Judy, which is, I'm realizing, is my TV obsession. Um, <laughs> but it's fascinating to me, and it's fascinating to think about it in terms of this um, uh, Ford um, uh, Kavanaugh thing, that there are two people who are telling diametrically opposed stories, and they both appear to be telling the truth. I actually don't think that Brett Kavanaugh appears to be telling the truth as much as a lot of people on Judge Judy do, but on Judge Judy, they do it. It's like, which one do you believe, you know? And um, I don't know, I just, after living 64 years, I just realized that human beings are very complex and intricate and dense and you know, that's why we need corroboration if this, if this were a criminal trial and that this would not rise to anything prosecutable. It's not a criminal trial. Uh, but the idea that Christine Ford is might be mistaken, I want to feel that. I want to feel into that. Because if it's true, and there's a chance it's true, then that recasts all of my judgments about Kavanaugh. And this is just good practice for making our minds more flexible. You can feel us, you can, might, might feel the, I don't want to do that, but it's good for us. All right, so the third uh, uh, argument that conservatives are making is that liberals are just partisan. And, um, you know, it's so funny because that's what my liberal friends think about conservatives, but it's just the strong coming the other way. And I think one of the ways that I can identify that in myself is the way even recently I've been feeling about Bill Clinton and the women that he supposedly uh, uh, attacked. And one of them, Juanita Broderick, is I find very convincing. And what he did with her was a rape by any standards, including biting the lip and, and I mean, read the details of it on Wikipedia. You don't have to go far to find it. Juanita Broderick. And it's very convincing. She, did, she was not going for publicity. She hid it for years. Um, she told people, you know, it's a, it's a very, very credible story. It's a more credible story, actually, in terms of a legal situation, I believe, than Christine Ford's in terms of corroboration and so forth. So anyway, um, to, to, to feel that my um, just reflexive support was for Clinton, that I saw her as, you know, somebody that the, the right had dug up from his past and was telling a story. And the truth of the matter is, I didn't even consider what she had to say, certainly not at the time. And Paula Jones and Jennifer Flowers, and there's a couple more. And I just thought that they were dredged up as political tools. So I don't think that anymore. And like I said, I did just a minimal amount of research into Juanita Broderick. It's pretty convincing. And then, you know, I mean, we can, we can go back to LBJ and JFK and, and you know, the... I was just reading a um, a review of the uh, of the tell alls by presidential mistresses, and there's a whole slew of them, <laughs> and some of them aren't pretty at all. Uh, so, anyway, so we we really do want this is an integral practice, just a basic integral practice is we want to fight reflexive monoperspectivalism. We want to notice when we're contracting around a particular perspective, generally green postmodern, you know, most for most of us. And, you know, we want to challenge it. And, and, and there's nothing, I'm going to bastardize it a little bit, but there's, I think, nothing more elegant than Byron Katie's little program of turning truth on its head, you know, where she asks you, when you're all worked up, up about something, the first, there's, there's a series of questions. The first question is, is it true? And so, you know, we can watch uh, Christine Blasey Ford and Kavanaugh and feel as I do that she's telling the truth. So, yeah, yes, it's true. 
So question number two, are you absolutely sure it's true? And that's where, uh, really? And I have to sort of pry my perspective open to the fact that there's almost nothing that's absolutely true that we can just really rely on. And that's not to say that we can't act as if it were, but are we absolutely sure is another question. The third move is, how do you feel when you believe it's true? And, you know, there is, a, as I said, a solidity that comes from um, contracting around a perspective. I always love the title of Chris Hedge's first book, which is called War is a Force that gives us meaning. And it's an indictment against the you know, modern wars. And, you know, and, he, and he talks about how fighting makes us feel real and being on a side and having a, a, a strong opinion and a perspective makes us feel solid. And that's you know, what we want uh, in order to function, but we also want to be liberated from it. We don't want to be contracted by it. And so then that brings us to question number four. The first one, again, is, is it true? Two, are you absolutely sure it's true? Three, how do you feel when you believe it's true? And four, who would you be if it were true? Or if you didn't believe it were true? And so there's a liberation that comes from that, where you realize, I wouldn't be so solid. I don't necessarily like it. It hurts a little bit. I'm a little afraid. I got to, and then we can sort of expand. As, you know, Whitman says, we inhale great drafts of space. We, we get more space and we can have more perspectives in that space. And that's a good thing to do. So, so, all right, so I did those two practices, self-observation, trying to take the other perspective, and I've softened up my habitual thinking, and I have a little more space, but I still have to be a good citizen and, you know, make a decision, have an opinion here. Should Kavanaugh get in? And so here's my thinking. Again, I offer it. You don't have to agree with it, but here's where I'm at. Um, so the current charge is that he lied to the committee about his drinking and his behavior as a teenager and, and uh, prevaricated and spun it and all of that good stuff. And I think that's true. Um, he was, uh, you know, this, this guy was a frat bro. You know, he was, I, I, I think there's always these interesting telling details that you hear about people. One girl that knew him said that he was, quote, more interested in impressing the guys than the girls. And we all know that guy, you know, and, you know, and, and, and that guy, particularly to the degree that he's white and, you know, uh, he's part of the, the last bastion of the patriarchy. It's a bogeyman of the left currently. And, you know, I guess I end up with, so frat bros get to be here. And so that's fine. And frat bros even maybe get to be on the Supreme Court, especially if they've cleaned up their act. And this, again, is we can you know, get a little bit more of an insight around this using integral theory that there is a fine tradition of wild young men being civilized into, you know, traditionalism. Okay, so you have teenagers who are vandalizing and rampaging and doing all the stuff that he's um, accused of doing, and they pull it together. You know, sometimes they go to the military, sometimes they have a religious conversion. Uh, these are time-honored strategies, but they become solid citizens, and they still have that past. past. And, you know, that's actually something that we as a culture need to be more conscious of is that red is actually a stage of development for both boys and girls as they naturally develop. They don't have a lot of impulse control. Um, they, the, the rebellion is just 
part of the the whole you know it's part of the, the it's a feature of this stage of development and that the goal is to live through it and express it nonviolently and uh, in a way that's actually healthy and for traditional societies there were all sorts of feats of endurance and so forth that would be a rite of passage to an adult civilized um, stage of development. But in our culture, we're, we're not that conscious of it. We're actually in a strange way doing a pretty good job of it because violence is way down. Uh, and a, a lot of it's happening aesthetically for us I mean, with, through music, um, you know, this crude music, you know, the, the bitches and bling and, you know, all of fighting and puffing up and, who you looking at and all of that stuff, very, very red. Video games, very, very red, a lot of fighting. Superheroes is just the classic red, you know. So all of these Marvel comic books and movies and so forth. This is, you know, the way we're currently dealing with that. And hallelujah, it sure beats, uh, you know, clubs and spears. So I'm, I, I could forgive and would forgive the prevaricating about his past. He's got two kids, you know, whatever. Most people would do that. This is a job interview. <laughs> uh, the second thing is his emotionalism. And, um, you know, he's very angry, that pinched face. I don't know if any of you saw, I assume you did. Um, what's his name on... Um, a Saturday Night Live. Um, oh, I'm forgetting. It was the opening act, but it was fantastic impersonation of Kavanaugh with this pinched face and spitting. And uh, they, he asks for a can of water and he gets it and he pops it open and drinks it like a, he's shooting a beer. Uh, anyway, um, that is problematic for me. But a friend of me, a friend of mine wrote me this morning and I, I just want to add this to my sort of perspective uh, stack. And he wrote, he said, I'm not going to fault Kavanaugh. He's against Kavanaugh. He's a you know, card-carrying liberal. But he writes, I'm not going to fault Kavanaugh for crying in his opening statement. When I was falsely accused of sexual assault in the mid-90s, I was terrified and cried for hours until she came to her senses a few hours later and admitted she was lying. So it's entirely possible he's crying because he feels trapped and helpless, much as I remember feeling when it all happened. When I step into his perspective and fully suspend my disbelief, my heart breaks. And so, you know, I think that's actually good, just as integral practice to suspend this belief and, and, and get into Kavanaugh's head and, and his heart. And, you know, that's just good practice. And I'm happy to do that and, and, and forgive that. Uh, but what hangs me up is his story about revenge uh, for the Clintons and that this is all trumped up uh, by the left, multi-million dollar campaign. It's based on resentment um, from Trump's election. And he actually said, what goes around comes around. And this is all in, in pretty hot anger. And that turned me off, I got to say. I'm not the only one. A lot of people are having the same reaction. Uh, because I think we realize that angry people have victim stories. And, um, and he's still nurturing uh, a, a victim story. And... I wonder, you know, is this just put him in a certain category that, you know, there's a subset of 17 year olds who would attack a, a girl, no matter how drunk they were. Most won't do that, but some will. And is that the same subset of people who are still nurturing these huge victim stories um, when they're 53? I, I don't know, but it, it turns me off. Uh, and you know, it's not that what he's saying isn't true. There is, there was a left-wing movement that was subsidized by big money. Uh, there, there is a lot of um, revenge for the Clintons and Trump's election. And this is a big political football. And yeah, he's a big boy. And this is the nature of a big boy job, um, especially now. 
and this is another cultural mo you know movement is that people's pasts aren't hidden anymore i think what's happened especially is with uh, social media but what's happening is we're going to be able to accommodate that all of us were sinners or, and still are but that's another podcast um but you know regarding you know would i hire him for this job and i wouldn't i, I i'm a thumbs down on kavanaugh and it's because of this last part this judicial temperament you know and it's one of the great emergence actually of traditionalism and, and even you know king solomon and the wise kings where you consciously try to be unattached to your passions. And that really comes to the fore in modernity, uh, where, you know, juries are instructed that way and, and judges, you know, really work on that. And you wouldn't want to be seen as being attached to your passions as he was. Now, I get why he did it, and it was actually very successful. I think the, the, the worm was turning for him when Christine Blasey Ford was done with her testimony. And he at least brought back his people with his, you know, performance, uh, much of which I thought was authentically felt. Uh, so, you know, if he gets through, and I, I think most people think he, well, who knows? I don't know. I hear people on both sides, but we don't know just yet. But if he does, I think we'll survive it. We've had partisans on the Supreme Court before. Uh, Scalia, I remember reading an a interview with Scalia right before he died, and he said he couldn't bear to listen to anything but Fox News when he was, uh, or, or reading the Washington Examiner, um, the conservative outlet in Washington, or what's the name of it? Anyway, the, the conservative paper, because he couldn't bear the lies of the left. So there's a partisan for you, you know. Um, and let's remember that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an attorney for the ACLU. Uh, Sotomayor, Kagan were both involved in left um, political movements. That's part of the deal at this stage of the game. Uh, but at least you can act like, you're, you know, I'm, I'm pro hypocrisy here with the judicious te judicial temperament. There's something that is actually progress over not even trying. So anyway, um, so that's, you know, I'm doing my duty. I came up with a thumbs down. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, um, uh, the culture wars go on. And I, I, I note that uh, it, it is getting the, the the polarization is getting intensifying and you can even see it with these Supreme Court justices. I looked it up and saw that the last four justices were Sotomayor and she was approved 68 to 31. Kagan, Elena Kagan was 63 to 37. Gorsuch was big fight there and all kinds of shenanigans, but still Gorsuch got in at 54, 45. And this one is going to be even tighter than that, I think. Uh, but I will say, uh, just as one little upbeat note at the end here, that it's not as bad as it used to be. Uh, <laughs> there's a, uh, a review of an interesting book here uh, in New York Times this weekend uh, called Field, The Field of Blood, and it's about violence in Congress. And it's written by Joanne Freeman. And she writes, between 1830 and 1860, there were more than 70 violent incidents between congressmen in the House and Senate chambers or on nearby streets and dueling grounds most of them long forgotten. So 70 violent incidents. So even if um, Lindsey Graham got in a wrestling match with Dianne Feinstein, it still would be an anomaly. Um, and uh, well, I, I, I will give this last paragraph. She, she says, the Southerns were vulnerable to goading. This was back pre-Civil uh, pre War because of the code of honor that they followed. According to this code, even a mild insult could trigger a fight. And that is a sort of a red thing, you know, that, that uh, you know, who you talking to kind of thing. And um, that's a feature of a, agrarian traditionalism. 
but very few people are at that stage of the game uh, these days. You know, it's not to say that there aren't 20% or more, but um, we're in a different world now. And if you listen to the Daily Evolver, you, you know that I'm actually in many ways sympathetic to the culture war and realize that the culture war, like all wars, are actually as hard as it is to wrap your head around, evolutionarily potent, uh, kind of like asteroids can be. Uh, so again, not pretty, but beautiful. And uh, so, you know, as long as we keep it nonviolent, let's get out there and fight the good fight and continue to make a more good, true and beautiful world. Okay? Okay. All right, well, that's my two cents on Kavanaugh and we will see how it goes. And I will be back in a couple days for another Daily Evolver Live. And I appreciate you being here and we'll see you then. Take care, folks. Bye.